Hello, everybody, and welcome to Mother Forever. I am Orange, and I'm here with my crew, Nokolo. Go ahead. Hello. Echoes and Bones. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Hey. And we are here with the wonderful Reed Man, or Reed Young, from Fangamer and Starman.net. Hello. So, let's go ahead and begin by asking what your background with the Mother series has been. Uh, where did you first discover the games, and how did you feel during your first experience with them? Well, I think the, the first encounter I had was Nintendo Power. And uh, I don't remember where it first appeared. It might have been the, the one that... I remember Nintendo Powers by what the cover was. And so I think the first time I saw it was the NBA Jam cover, uh, which was a really good uh, issue. And uh, just reading about it, and especially seeing the clay models and just the, the kind of little world that they prepared and showed, and Nintendo Power just had me totally hooked. And so when I saw that there was a coupon, I was like, that's it. I am mowing lawns. I'm saving money. We're going to do this. And I begged my parents to drive me uh, into the nearest town because I lived out in the sticks and uh, drove to Target, picked up Earthbound as soon as I knew it was available. And uh, yeah, that was the beginning of that. That was 95. I think it was, you know, late summer or like maybe fall of 95. And um yeah, I, I just fell in love. I played. I remember playing through Earthbound and Chrono Trigger. I think. I think it might have been the next, the following summer, when I basically just played those two games nonstop, uh, and that was uh, that was a wonderful summer. So. <laughs> That's yeah, it's awesome. great. It's, it's 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 funny you mention uh, those two particular games because when I was kind of your age, I had played both of those two games on a black and white TV on a Super Famicom in Japanese completely. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, oh, man. <laughs> I was just like you. I was in, you know, the sticks of really poor, you know, and didn't have really much of anything. So it's kind of funny that we have um, some sort of familiarity with, with that type of experience. Um, and it's the only things we had, you know. We, we, we made do with what we had. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. And it and it's funny that you mentioned Nintendo Power too as your sort of jumping off platform because from my recollection, I think funny enough, the first time I ever learned about Starman.net was from the uh, Super Mario Galaxy issue. Oh, really? Nintendo Power. <laughs> there was a yeah. community section when y'all went up to uh, Nintendo and like met with the crew, and and that's so. how you learned about Starman. Yeah, so oh, I, well, good. yeah, I didn't go to Starman until I think a couple years after that, but it was still something that I distinctly remember, and I still have the issue. I think it's probably at my parents' house somewhere, but yeah. Yeah, that so, was, that was a, uh, that, that is a neat way for things to come full circle, huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this is going to be quite the genesis of a question, so <laughs> let's generalize its synopsis best we can. So what were your experiences with the Mother series and its community leading up to today with uh, the development of Mother Forever? Well, I when I first got involved, it was, it was basically I was just out there on my own because I had searched and I had found like maybe one or two sites. And this is back in around like 1996 or so. Um, when I first really got on the internet and was able to like hop on web crawler and do some searching and I found like one kind of like half site. It was just like a page on somebody's site where they talked about earthbound, but there was really no information. It was just like, Oh, earthbound's cool. Here's a Mr. Saturn and ASCII art, you know? Um, and so I started building my own page on my site. Uh, and then people came to that. Like people somehow found my site. I don't, you know, I, I remember so little from back then, but. Uh, ultimately, people ended up coming. Um, and so as the community around my site started to build, I started to learn that there were other things out there. Like I'd never been on AOL, but apparently there was an AOL group called the Earthbound Gang. Um, and then another one called the Sharks. You know, there's all these these things that were out there that I had no idea existed <laughs> because, again, search was so primitive back then. And, you know, a AOL was a walled garden. Um <laughs> but, you know, like having my horizons very slowly expanded bit by bit, uh, leading up to basically, I'd say by the time Starman.net formed, 
um, you know, like out of earthbound.net, it really was basically the place to be. There wasn't a whole lot of like undiscovered territory at that point. Um, so it was, it was very fascinating for those couple of years, you know, as we slowly consolidated these fans, like, you know, we all kind of conglomerated around this one website. Uh, it was a very, very exciting, uh, heady time <laughs> to be in the community. Yeah, for sure. Uh, one thing that really stands out to me about the community, uh, even early back then, is that some of the uh, Japanese side of the fan base uh, did uh, get involved. You know, you attracted their attention. There was Excelsior, who actually played the uh, Earthbound 64 Space World demo and provided photos and information for that, which was incredible and unfounded. You know, IGN didn't even have that at the time. Yes, and that was and that was one of those basically kind of we kind of considered it the, the final frontier of fandom. <laughs> and like, I remember for the first probably five years, uh, maybe four years or so of the community, we kind of thought of Japan as just a different universe. Like we didn't, it, it didn't occur to a lot of us that, you know, we could make inroads and start discussing with and communicating with people because uh, basically we had like Clyde and like, you know, one or two other people who would, you know, who were mostly lurkers who spoke Japanese and could really give us any kind of bridge to the Japanese community. Yeah. And so it was very mysterious, uh, very like, you know, once in a while, like, you know, people would, you know, run around on the Japanese websites and try to get whatever images they could. And that was the thing that was mostly exciting for us. Like, oh, cool, check out this, this high-res scan of Ness or whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so that was that was the main interaction that we had with the Japanese community until you said uh, Excelsior and Captain Apollo was another one. Um, Captain Apollo ran a site, I think it was mother-jp.net. And uh, it was a pretty big fan site. He had, he had good enough English skills that he actually was able to talk with us. And so we kind of communicated a little bit. And ultimately, we actually ended up hosting his website on uh, Starman's uh, server. Um, so yeah, there was there was inroads occasionally from time to time, but uh, it remained pretty walled off from us uh, for a good chunk of the community's existence. And I honestly, I don't know what it's like today. Like, have you guys uh, like do you have much crossover between Japan? And, uh, uh, I believe fans? we have. Like, we've talked to we've talked to Koala. We've talked to mm -hmm. some folks over mm -hmm. at Mother Party. Um, I've been in contact with a few of those folks every now and then just to talk about like whether they have any Earthbound merchandise that we haven't seen before or anything like that. And, and surprisingly, every single, you know, once a week or so, I find something new. I find something interesting that I've never seen before when it comes to Earthbound guides or just, you know, a little figure here or... or a mother two lighter, like you know, this silly, yeah. silly little oh, things. Yeah. And uh, lighters are yeah, crazy. I heard. <laughs> and so it, it's 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 interesting to hear from the other side, you know, from the the east side of everything, and then you know the west, and you know them coming together. And that was the intention of uh, Mother Forever, more or less, is to bring community more or less home, but also to Go into that obscurity where we find all that information that, you know, we've been looking for for years, practically. You know, um, a lot of the research from Earthbound 64, a lot of the research that Bones has done for Mother 1, you know, we'd want to make a space where it comprises all of that into one place. And uh, that's the more or less common goal. But to get, you know, people from overseas interested and, and all that is, is, is great. I love... I love hearing that. So, yeah, and seeing you know seeing you guys make progress on that stuff is just wonderful. Like I saw all the stuff happening with uh, Earthbound sixty four and you know Mother three, uh, you know like researching all the old sixty uh, four DD stuff, and you know the like the the weird magazine uh, like <laughs> what, do you, what do you call them the Mother the three. Mother Three Times. Mother the Mother Three, three times. times, yes. Yeah. Like that, that is pure, like that would have been the development of a half decade uh, <laughs> during Starman.net's time. Like nothing would have topped that, you know? So it's yeah. really exciting to see you guys, you know, unearthing this stuff. Yeah, I, I managed to find it actually um, looking through the National Diet Library of Japan. I, I thought 
hmm, if there's any place that would have documented these things, it would be a library. So I checked, and they happen to have documented all of those old uh, Dengeki Nintendo 64 magazines, and they had all of the scans available. They sent them to me uh, from Japan, and that's how we were able to get them all. Oh, so you actually had the, the magazine shipped? Well, uh, not the magazines themselves. They actually scanned their copies and sent us oh. scans. Yes. Wow. But they went to the trouble of scanning magazines for <laughs> you. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So they, they actually have an infrastructure built into the library's website for online scans to be sent overseas for research purposes. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah, so uh, since I speak Japanese and I can read it, I went through and just ordered all the ones with Mother 3 Nintendo 64 in them, and we got them all. Yeah, and stuff like that, you know, we just, uh, there are things like that that we just kind of dreamed of, you know, back in the day. But, uh, you know, we, we were too busy building, um, just trying to keep our community, like build up our community as is right. and trying to achieve, yeah. you know, the few goals that we had set for ourselves at the time. Um, but the advancement of the internet has made a lot of different things possible now. And so you guys, you guys are able to focus yeah. on things like that instead of like, all right, we got to build the infrastructure to make it possible for people to communicate. <laughs> yes. yeah. Yeah. We need Great to, to not have to rebuild gallery. that. Re yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so on to the next question. Do you have a favorite game in the Mother series and why? And do you have any favorite characters, songs, locations, or moments you want to share? So I got to stick with Earthbound as my favorite just because it was the original one, you know, the thing that really brought me into the fold in the first place. Um, and I will cop to the fact that I had never played, well, I, I had played, but I'd certainly never beaten Mother until about what was it like a year year and a half ago yeah. <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> which uh you know I, I i as someone who was you know a founder of the online community for earthbound it's a little bit shameful for me but uh it was really fun playing through it you know and like getting to all these things that i had experienced second and third hand over the course of like two decades yeah. Um, and like, oh, that's how they use that sprite, or that's where that screenshot came from, or this is why people are always talking about this one character. Um, and getting to like uh, experience that backwards was really interesting. Uh, and it was also really exciting to just see what a phenomenal game was made with this ancient hardware. And, you know, I'm, I'm sometimes, I'm, I'm often surprised by like how hard game designers went back in the day. And like, you know, the, the developers who, uh, and Etoy, of course, who created Mother, um, really pulled off some really impressive, uh, not tricks, but just like, you know, sleight of hand and the different things that they did and the way they managed to convey story on this ancient system. Um, you know, I, and I feel the same way when I play an old game like, uh, like Metal Gear on the Game Boy Color. You know, like that's another one that's like, wow, it just blows your mind how, how these developers used every they squeezed every ounce of juice out of the tools that they had at their disposal um so yeah so mother mother was very interesting because i finally experienced that long after the fact and mother three i i love mother three and i think it's i i know it best in terms of like knowing it inside out because we did the work on the handbook uh and so i i feel most well i felt most familiar with it um, but over the years since we did the handbook, because it's been, uh, geez, it's been like 12 years now since we did the handbook or something, uh, 11 years. And since then, I've forgotten so much of that game. I've forgotten so much of what I'd written and worked on for the handbook. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm looking forward to experiencing Mother 3 uh, for the first time again sometime soon. <laughs> Well, hopefully in that in that situation it'll be official, maybe. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we'll maybe. You <laughs> all to hear uh, your own voice as OJ in the patch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Boy, there, yeah, and there's stuff like that. I forgot. Like I I had to go through like I had to boot it up a couple of years ago, in order to do something. I had to get a screenshot or something. I don't remember what the situation was. And one of the title screens came up. I was like, oh my gosh, I put that together. I, I did the Photoshop file for that. And I totally forgotten that I 
that was like one of two things I did in the entire translation patch. Uh, so to be like, it was like, oh my gosh, I forgot all about all the stuff that I did way back in the day. You know, it was kind of weird. That's really neat to hear about. Thank you. Yeah. So I don't know. Did I answer both parts of that question? I think I for, oh. already forgot half of it. Uh, I think uh, the, the other part of that question the is, other do part you have any... Was... Uh, do you, yeah, do you have any favorite characters or songs, locations, or moments? Oh, yeah. Anything specific? So the um, the tank in Mother is phenomenal. Like, I was so... Uh, I didn't see that coming, and that was so exciting and fun when I finally yeah. came to that part in the game, when That's I played it. Just, moment. <laughs> yeah, it's like a year or two ago. Um, for Earthbound, I would have to say... Probably the thing that's most visceral for me is the uh, the Gigas battle. Um, like when you like when you first Very... hear you hear the first uh, eight bit rendition of the beginning of the Gigas battle music. Uh, I remember sitting on the edge of my bed playing that at night uh, when I was when I was beating the game for the first time. And when the music kicked in, I was like, ah! <laughs> I was like <laughs> trying, trying not to actually scream because I'd wake up, you know, my brother and sister. But uh, it was just, it hit me so hard. Like it was such, uh, such an intense moment. Um, and so every time I hear that music, uh, I, I just kind of, I, I don't get transported back, but I just remember you know, I have very fond memories of uh, playing uh, through the my my first playthrough there. And then for Mother Three, I would say, boy. I guess for Mother 3, one of, one of my favorite parts was the Osohe Castle, just because it was so weird and so, um, I'm trying to think how to describe it, like, it feels like an entire separate game that they had built and tied in, and they're like, you know what, we'll just cut it off here, and it'll just exist <laughs> as this weird vestigial limb inside of Mother 3. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And something about that I really like. It's uh, it's, it's a very uh, a very fun part of the game, especially with the ghosts. It's like, whenever I see the ghosts drinking wine, I'm like, oh man, I I love <laughs> that game so much. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, Chapter Two of Soy Castle is actually a lot of people's least favorite part of the game. Really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, a lot of people. I, the complaints I hear is that some find it kind of out of place or too grindy or. Some just find it boring, but I agree. Like it's so silly. I love that part too. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's really enjoyable, especially you know with Duster as the protagonist. Right. Yeah. The first thing that I think of in the chapter two is just just um, Mind of the Thief. I think is what it's called. That that song is just yes. Like, mm, yeah, that that's song. so good. And then uh, you also get to hear the first rendition of uh, I think Fate as well with the the zombie dog. It's like the uh, oh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Yes. <laughs> oh, I, I yeah, love that. that song. I love that song. It's so good. <laughs> I also kind of want to circle back for a second. This is a little selfish. I kind of want to circle <laughs> back for a second and just highlight uh, how many, like, how much it seems like you've come around to enjoy Mother One as a game. Oh because yeah. Because I paid good money to watch you play that. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long time. Yes, that that was a long time coming. I don't. I think did that did the the beginning of that gag. I mean, uh, the gag has been running for uh, almost two decades now. But yeah. I think we really started hammering on it at the first. Was it first camp fan game or was it Earthbound Bash? Yeah. I, oh I man, I, I think I the know. Earthbound Bash might have had a jab or two at it. I know <laughs> that it started. Picking up at Camp Fan Gamer. I remember it there. <laughs> and 2016 was when you started taking donations where every right, time, that's right. Every certain <laughs> amount of money that came in, you would play a minute of the game. It was like, yeah. <laughs> dollar to minute match. Oh boy, yeah, and I, I definitely underestimated that. how much uh, money was gonna come in because I thought, all right, this will this will be good. I you know I'll I'll say it'll be a, a dollar a minute. And I'll end up having to play, like, you know, three hours of the game. And that definitely <laughs> was not the case. <laughs> yeah, and then we started packing it in towards the end of the event, too, where, like, after the finale of 
the Camp Fan Gamers like ARG. It was us standing off stage, like guiding you through Duncan's factory. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and boy, did I need that help because, like, getting through Duncan's factory, like that, I, I think the furthest I'd gotten so initially. Difficult. <laughs> yeah, it was insanely difficult. And the furthest I'd gotten before that was the graveyard. Um, you know, which uh, was uh, its own, I mean, not nearly as annoying or difficult as the factory, obviously, but those two things were would have been such big obstacles for me. Without people pushing and, like, outside pressure, there's no way I would have, like, uh, you know, gotten past that on my own. <laughs> yeah, sure. I know especially Duncan's Factory is, like, one of the really big bottlenecks for people playing that game, so... Has anybody uncovered why that uh, factory is so awful? <laughs> my guess would be... Well, so in terms of level design, I have no idea why they did it that way. <laughs> uh, in terms of, like, getting lost, though, I think a lot of it has to do with the tiling because everything looks yeah, the same. It, yeah, it really does. Yeah, that was. I know that was <laughs> a big problem for me is I kept getting lost in it. <laughs> yeah, I guess that would explain it. I just wondered, like, were they trying, like, they, they clearly weren't trying to, like, get quarters out of people at the arcade. Yeah. So I was like, well, why would, they, why would they put that in there? Why would they do that to their players? <laughs> yeah. Well, also, Mother just has, in general, a really big map. So pretty much any area in the game is a little bit bigger than it probably needs to be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There was a... That place there was a There was a fan <laughs> project. I think it's actually, it's actually hosted on our site. Uh, it's the mother 25th anniversary hack I, I think um, they changed Duncan's factory to have a more understandable palette overall like the whole the whole map nice. so like all the tiles don't really seem as confusing to the player I haven't played all the way through but I, I I'm already at um, right right as I was about to get wood so I might see if that one's a little bit easier. Then back to the the joke about the mother. You, you know, you know, you're playing mother one for a minute per dollar. Uh, there, there seems to be a another running gag in in uh, the mother forever community. Actually, is before I started making this website with uh, the folks here, uh, I had made a video called "Remembering Earthbound." It was a video on YouTube, just reminiscing about the past and all. And I had nonchalantly said that I will make a Mother 3 video one day. So ever since then, I have been <laughs> bugged by multiple people asking for a Mother 3 <laughs> video, and it still has not ended today. So I feel like Reggie. <laughs> Where is Mother 3? <laughs> I was going to say, there's a, there's a good Reggie parallel there. That works out yeah. pretty well. <laughs> but uh, it, anyways, um, yeah, that was that's great. <laughs> Yeah, I can probably move on to the yeah. Go ahead too. Um, sure. This, so you've probably told this story a few times before, um, but for anyone who might not know, how was Starman.net founded? Like the process of making the site. Well, I guess it depends on if you're talking about Starman or Earthbound. Well, I guess because uh, it's gone through a lot of different uh, iterations too. Right. Yeah. I think that might be interesting to go over, especially for like some of the younger. So why not? Why not both? Too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I'll I'll try to keep this relatively brief. Um, so basically, there were there were basically three sites from my perspective. Obviously, you know, different people in the community have different perspectives on this stuff, but from where I stand, I started well. I guess four sites. The first site was just a stupid website that I made where it had one page about Earthbound. Um, and then the rest of my website got deleted. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go all in, all in my Earthbound page. And I turned that into a website called You Are Now Earthbound. And that was basically just uh, me. Like, I started off basically just, you know, scanning. Like, uh, I, I had an ancient uh, SCSI scanner. I don't remember how I ended up in possession of this gigantic beast. But I used it to scan uh copies of the uh like images from the manual and the player's guide into uh you know on, onto my computer and upload on my website and to this day every once in a while i will see one of my original scans and i recognize <laughs> it because of the weird like uh you know um pattern uh you know like this crappy scanner that i used <laughs> so, so 
So anyway, so I, that was a website called You Are Now Earthbound. And I updated that for a couple of years. And that, that went until I think close to like uh, sometime around 1998. And then that was about the time that uh, Tomato, Clyde Mandolin, reached out. And, you know, we, we had been kind of collaborating on a couple things. And we started working on our first petition, a petition together. And I don't remember if he reached out to me first or what, but we, and we collaborated on a mother on Game Boy Color petition. Um, and long story short, you know, that ended up getting uh, posted on IGN back in the day. And that was, that was a huge deal. Like that just kind of blew my mind seeing this thing that we had made being talked about on uh, basically the only gaming news site on the internet <laughs> as far as I was concerned. Um, and so after that, he, Clyde started talking to me and he said like, um, well, actually, you know, that, that might not be correct. I think what happened was uh, earthbound.net started around that time. And this was kind of a an outside person uh, whose name was Buzz Buzz came to me um, saying that hey you know I'm starting this group of people and we're gonna we're gonna make a a big central website about Earthbound because up until then you are now Earthbound was my site it was probably the biggest one that, on the internet that was focused on Earthbound but it was really just my site like I, I didn't have a full well I think I had a forum but it was really primitive um, you know there wasn't really a community it was just me putting things on the site. Yeah, and so this guy said, you know, I'm starting, I'm starting the Earthbound movement, is how he uh, referred to it, which sounds too close to bowel movement in retrospect. So I wish, I wish he hadn't used that phrase. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, he was really excited about starting this big community project for Earthbound.net. So we started working on it, and um, he had this really grand vision uh, for. You go on this website and you can click through, like you see the world map of Earthbound and you can click through anywhere, like you can click through into Onet, for example. And then within Onet, you know, you see all the, the houses and you click on any house, you can go into the house and that house belongs to someone in the community. And so we would like rent out houses to people and they would have their own website hosted. It was a really An strange uh, approach. Animal very, Crossing? Very late <laughs> Animal 90s. Crossing? What's that? Animal yes. Crossing? <laughs> 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 so you know he he was really gung-ho about this i was like well i don't know sure let's try it and so we started off trying to build saturn valley and you know uh it didn't get very far at all and clyde came along and said listen what you're doing right now with earthbound.net is stupid but you could do something really cool if you listen to me <laughs> and luckily i did and so clyde really got in there and it was entirely his effort like I brought a lot of existing community to this and like, you know, I was kind of the bridge between a big chunk of the Earthbound community and Earthbound.net and Clyde. But Clyde had this, uh, a vision different from Buzz Buzz's that was actually workable and good. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> thankfully, you know, his vision won out. Um, and so there was definitely some squabbling back and forth about Earthbound.net. Like the guy who we kind of, you know, we, we veered away from his vision of the Earthbound movement and, you know, this this uh, community, like, uh, rental website. And we end up doing, you know, Clyde's vision of Earthbound.net, which is very close to what Starman.net uh, was and still really is today. Just, you know, like, a central main page with updates, you know, like a clear, like, uh, an ordered list of updates of what's been changing, what's new, etc., uh, which, you know, was kind of new at the time. That wasn't really, I know it sounds so obvious to be like, yeah, of course you go to a website and you see the news, like, why wouldn't you do that? But that, that wasn't necessarily like a, uh, a very clear convention back in the day. Like these things were still being created in the late nineties. Um, so thankfully Clyde was ahead of the curve on that. And after a dispute about the domain name earthbound.net, um, we, we kind of had a poll with the community and we said, Hey, we're starting our own, we're, we're like, we're moving the community over to a different website. What are we going to call it? And I remember we bounced around a lot of ideas for names. Um, some are really stupid, and I kind of regret not going with a really stupid one, but we landed on Starman.net uh, for better and worse. And um, that was that was basically where it stayed for the next uh, 15 years or so. Can I ask where the uh, do not underestimate us came from? So, I mean, of course, that's a quote from the Starman uh, in the game. 
Yeah. And I think when we came up with that, I'm pretty sure we came up with that kind of slogan. Actually, no, that's not true. No, okay, so when we when we first started Starman.net, I think the slogan was different. I want to say it was get back in the game. Okay. Um, and, you know, we, we went through a couple different slogans as we would redesign the site. Or rather, I would redesign the site because that was really one of my big things in the community was just like constantly tinkering and redesigning and changing the site much to everybody's chagrin. It drove people crazy, um, but I couldn't help myself. I really enjoyed doing that. And so when I would redesign the site, I would come up with new, you know, new logo, new graphics, new everything. And that was one of the phrases that I came upon uh, because we, I want to say that was probably either right before or during the second petition, which was the, um, the Earthbound 64 petition. And uh, for that petition, we managed to get about a little over 10,000 signatures. And we were really feeling it, you know, we're like, oh yeah, we are the most powerful beings on the internet and Nintendo is going to have to <laughs> rock in with us, <laughs> which uh, was a little over the top, but hey, you know, you, you got to have an option. Yeah, I mean, you did have Marcus uh, Limbloom on your side. <laughs> that, that's true. Yeah, yeah, we did. In retrospect, especially, uh, we realized how many fairly high profile people we had, you know, following and kind of rooting for us. Like, uh, you know, one of the things that we were doing for the, for the, you are now, or sorry, the Earthbound USA documentary, it's kind of going back through, because I, I still have a printed copy of one of those petitions. And so, uh, you know, Jazzy and the crew kind of dug through it and just kind of, you know, just looking to see what they can see. And they ended up uh, bookmarking, I don't know, probably a couple dozen pages that have signatures from people who went on to become high profile people in the gaming industry. Um, and so, you know, we've got like major, major journalists, game developers, uh, you know, all the, all these people who ended up signing the petition and then went off to do, you know, whatever, which statistically makes sense when you've got, you know, 30,000 plus signatures in a document, uh, you know, eventually you're going to catch people who go on to do something really cool. So, you know, it's not like, it's not insane that this happened, but it's still really fun to go back and look and see like, oh man, we had this little core sample of the gaming community at the time, uh, just kind of like found this petition that we had put together and signed it. And it's just, now we have this like, you know, impression, this, uh, this fossilized thing that we can refer back to. It's kind of fun. Well, yeah, that's, yeah. So, um... go ahead. Oh, yeah. No, I was just saying, speaking of that, it kind of ties into the, the next question. Orange kind of ties into right, that, too. Right, because, so, you know, the, we all started to talk about, you know, the main role that you had in Starman.net. So, you know, what what was your main role on the site after Starman.net was founded? Like, what other kind of projects did you work on that really stand out to you now? I I would say... I had a lot of roles over the years. Um, ultimately, the way it generally worked out with anything in the community is that I uh, put myself in or ended up in charge of community stuff. And so like, I, my goal was to uh, you know, kind of maintain the, the health of the community and push for community initiatives and try to keep people interested and engaged and getting involved in doing stuff. Whereas Clyde was really much more focused on the technical side of things. So like actually building the site, making sure it ran, um, you know, checking analytics, understanding how to like, how we could improve, you know, thinking of ways that we could archive things better or, uh, you know, like get information about Earthbound presented in a digestible, you know, searchable way. Like those kind of things were his, his focus. Whereas I was, you know, just busy, like, you know, helping helping build and run the community proper. Um, and so that was that was really my role for most of the time. You know, like, and, and like I said before, I did a lot of, with the actual design. Like I was, uh, I stayed pretty heavily involved in, um, like putting together the, the look and feel of the website and trying to make it, uh, I don't know, like I, I didn't approach it with a, a vision or anything. It's just like, it's something that, I made up as I went. Like I didn't go into this as a designer because I wasn't a designer. Um, but in the course of creating Starman.net and its designs, I became a designer. Um, and that was 
in retrospect, you know, I really like, I'm not, I'm not nostalgic about it. I don't know how to describe it, but it's like, that was really cool that I, like my, my drive to do this thing, to work on this community and this website led me to teach myself a vocation. Uh, yeah. And I just, I just figured it out, you know, because I, I had to, it's like, well, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not teaching myself design, but I'm solving these problems that designers solve. And in retrospect, it's like, yeah, I taught myself to be a designer. Um, and I really think that kind of passion would only come from something like Earthbound, at least for me personally. And I, and that's kind of much for a lot of people in the, the end out of the community is that they can find something like that in their lives that is so exciting to them. And especially when they're young and they have like endless amounts of time, um, that it inspires them to, uh, to, to learn to do things that they want to do for the rest of their lives. Uh, and it's, that's really a blessing and uh, one that I hope more people can experience. Yeah, for sure. I can definitely sympathize with uh, that ideal because when I play Earthbound or any of the other games, I get the sense that it teaches you how to problem solve. It gives you this ability to sort out and assess a, a solution for what problem you're going through right now. And that's how I actually designed uh, Mother Forever is I looked back that I looked back into the past of some designs that Starman.net had made and one of them that stuck out was it had this really 90s aesthetic. It had the big old Starman and just like Starman.net with, you know, sidebars on the left, sidebars on the right. And, you know, I took this design and I was like, this is very nostalgic because I remember looking at Starman.net from afar and just, you know, what if I took this design and sort of make it my own, right? And, and that's what I mm -hmm. did. You know, I took um, a good amount of inspiration from both sites, Starman.net and Earthbound Central. And so to hear someone who has a similar... Um, aspect in terms of graphic design. Uh, I'm not necessarily a, a big graphic designer myself. Not so much anymore. I, I, I jumped out of that in industry and now I'm in teaching. So it, it's it's interesting to hear someone who's not as well adept with that type of material and then suddenly do things that someone of that stature would be capable of doing. So uh it's yeah and you know and i think you're totally right that earthbound kind of uh encourages this and like kind of plants the seed for this because of all of the sampling and remixing especially for the soundtrack mm -hmm. that earthbound did like you know it 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 dipped into b movies and it dipped into all these different types of pop culture and uh you know literally sampling things for the soundtrack as well and using that as a basis but then converting it into this totally separate thing um, I don't know. There's something. There's something very visceral and exciting about that, and I think Earthbound captures that so well, and that transfers to the people that love Earthbound. You know, that, that's just kind of a, you know, a, a nice little infection that we all catch <laughs> playing yeah. this game. It's, it's quite infectious, and and you know that that's a that's a good thing for most of us, hopefully. So you know, um, it's it's interesting. I. I you know, it, it keeps that optimism for everyone and, and keeping that positive growth, not only towards the older generation, but the newer generations and, and so forth. You know, um, one of our goals in mind is, you know, we want to have more translation patches of the game in multiple different languages. So not only do you have to, so, no, so you don't have to learn English or Japanese to play this game. You could l play it in your own native language. So everyone gets to play. It's not just, you know, a small group of people. And I think that experience is enduring for a lot of folks. It's it's something that I think everyone should be able to experience. So hearing that from you and hearing, you know, these experiences on how you developed and, and organized uh, Starman.net is very encouraging for me uh, moving forward with this project. Yeah, and I don't want to speak for Clyde, but I'm confident that uh, he's totally behind that as well. Like, he loves seeing people take charge and, like, take something like a translation and bring it to more people and making it accessible to more people. Like, that's that's one of his favorite things, I'm confident. And I and I love to see it as well. So it's it's very cool to hear that you, you took inspiration from 
things that had been done before and you want to build on top of that and improve upon it and that's i love it well i appreciate that uh echoes yeah uh, speaking of you know influencing other people and uh positive things uh what was the experience like watching the site grow and therefore meeting many other mother fans from around the world are there any particularly fun memories you can recall when you first met more fans of the series boy well i mean the <laughs> it's interesting the the people who met for the very first time when we had our, our first convention was I mean, I use convention in a very loose sense of the term here, uh, but it was five of us, including me. Uh, <laughs> it was, and ultimately, the five people who attended that convention ended up becoming my brother-in-law, my wife, uh, the CEO of Fangamer Japan, and an investor in Fangamer. If that gives you a sense of like the crazy <laughs> connections that we didn't realize were forming in that moment, um, and that's that's something that I. Uh, I am so, it's hard, it's hard to describe the emotion that I have about those times because obviously when you're in the middle of this, like when you're, when you're in a community and you're interacting and you're doing stuff together, you're just, you know, you're just having fun. You're doing whatever. It's cool. Hey, this is great. But you're not, you don't think about the future in these scenarios usually. Um, and so looking back on that, it's like, oh my gosh, like if we knew then what, what we would become, what we would do together. Um, how would that have changed us? Like, what would we have done? What that information, you know, would that have, you know, affected the course of things? But um, yeah, getting getting to know people uh, in person, especially, reached every aspect of the community that we had already formed online. Like, a lot of us were friends. You know, we talked all the time. We occasionally we'd even do voice chat, which was very difficult in the late nineties. Um, you know, and once in a while we we would break down. Like, all right, you know what? Let's just do a phone call. Chat sucks, you know. Twenty eight point eight K modem is just cutting it for <laughs> voice chat. Um, and so, you know, we'd spend like long distance uh, money to actually talk on the phone when when it was necessary. But getting to meet people in person uh, drove so much stuff home and brought the community so much closer together. And I really think that it made everything that came thereafter possible. Um, like without the, the the conventions, each one grew. Um, up until just, you know, like, I think the, the last time I was really involved in the Starman.net conventions was probably around like 2000, uh, 2010 or 11 or so. Yeah, um, that tracks. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and we had, we had one almost every year with, with a couple exceptions. And uh, each time, like the first one was five people. The next one was like 12. The one after that was like 24. And we had one of 30. And then, you know, eventually we got to like 50 or 60 people. Uh, and that's when it really became difficult to manage. Um, but uh, I, I didn't want to put caps on it because every time we got new people in there, uh, it was just, it was that much better. Like, you know, it, it was hard to manage that many people, but I never regretted having people at these things because it was so fun to meet other people who were, People who had a single common point, which was Earthbound, and that acted as kind of a, uh, I guess I'll say like a high pass filter. It's like, okay, if you, you know, if you don't like Earthbound, that excludes a wide swath of the population um, who, you know, uh, you know, we might naturally just not get along in the first place. It wouldn't be fun to hang out. So, you know, that, that made that a moot point. And so it be began to come, become clear that by hanging out with Earthbound fans, I was probably going to have a good time because we share these common interests and these common traits. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know where I was going with that, but that's <laughs> you know that's just something that I, I feel really strongly yeah. about. Like yeah, you know, having sure. having a common point of interest uh, and getting to meet and hang out with people who share that uh, is so important. And especially if you can do that in a non-commercial environment i think that's probably the second most important thing is that you know it's not it's not something that you're doing as you know for a company or you're you know you're not getting paid to do it it's not a work thing it's yeah. something born purely of just you know passion something that you're really excited about yeah. uh, i think that's really the recipe for some really great stuff yeah well and i interviewed a lot of people at camp fan gamer uh 2016 um 
just because just to get like you know from Mother Earth, we were doing like trying to get a sense of like what fans uh, sort of bonded over um, with the game and like with the series, and I think that that was something that was really. Um, how do I put? I feel like that's something that everybody said was that Starman.net and that like having Earthbound fans come together immediately kind of clicked because there were so many different things that you could like bond together with. Yeah, and it worked so well because Earthbound, like liking Earthbound, was the prerequisite. But then you know once you pass that you know that initial check. There's a there's a huge possibility space, and there were so many like subdivisions within uh, the Earthbound community. Like you know the uh, I, I don't want to say clicks necessarily, but you know just this uh, it's not just you know people who like ROM hacking and that's it. ROM hackers are just one tiny portion of this massive community. You know there's the artists, there's you know the uh, the programmers, there's the, the musicians, uh, and the fact that all these different elements of the game were so good and so inspirational, I think kind of created these really unique starting conditions that made the Earthbound community what it is and made it just this incredibly creative force that clearly still persists today, which is just mind blowing. <laughs> like, there's not many, I can't think of any other games off the top of my head that have been able to pull that off and like, and survive that long and actually thrive. Um, and I think, like I said, it's because like Earthbound started off with this really high quality um, content and the starting content that you know that you get people who are interested in this really quality starting content, and you will you will continue to see quality content coming from these people because you know they're already primed mm -hmm. for that. Right. Yeah. It's. Of... Oh, sorry. You go first, Curry. Curry. <laughs> no, I, I was actually going to bounce off of that for the next question, so you can go on. Okay, no, I was going to say, like, since I've been in the community, you know, well over a decade, uh, it's been amazing to see, like, starting off, you know, specifically for me, it was the filmmaking. We had, you know, say, Stephen George doing his, uh, you know, Earthbound gag series, and then Ubsy Movies doing Earthbound Saga. And then now they've moved on to Earthbound USA, as well as Bones here with Mother to Earth. We have actual, you know, feature length, professional documentaries. And we started with these little independent home movies. And that's just really exciting to see. Yeah. And, you know, I've talked about that so many times with different interviewers, but it always comes up that, like, uh, the community spawning all of these uh, incredibly talented people and all these wildly different uh vocations uh just never never ceases to fascinate me like i i am always surprised and thrilled when i meet yet another person who was in the earthbound community in some capacity and we end up crossing paths somehow and a lot of times it's because we end up working together on a project and they tell me about you know something that they they found uh, something that they did or contributed to or were inspired by whether it's by earthbound or the community um and it's just it's such a such a common thread between people. Um, I don't know, like the, it's just incredibly powerful. Uh, and you know, like I said, I, I don't I don't see other other communities or games really tapping into that. You know, I, I'm obviously you know heavily involved in other communities or games, so maybe it's just you know I've got blinders on. <laughs> um, but I I just have a I don't know if pride is the right word, but I, I am proud to see the community persisting uh, and, you know, carrying that tradition forward. It's very cool. Yeah, I definitely agree with that because, you know, most people don't really think with the idea of if you come in with the condition of making quality content or making something uh, that would be able to impact somebody where you're not going to get that same output from other people. So it's interesting how the community bounces back off of each other and you know you, you you have one person that makes this thing and they think it's cool and then you have someone else who gets inspired from that one person and kind of spreads and i think that's it's not entirely unique to earthbound specifically like the earthbound community but i think it's because of that particular reason that it has thrived for so long and still you know is amazing to just about anyone a newcomer or oldie you know so yeah yeah it's really true 
that kind of leads into the next question I was going to ask, actually, because um, I was going to ask about um, the submissions that you had to various events that you ran on, um, whether it's the forums or the sites. Um, were there any really great standout submissions that you personally really liked that you can still remember? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I That's the main way, like... I have a pretty bad memory. Like, I don't remember stuff that happened, like, you know, a couple days ago sometimes. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, uh, it's a bit of an issue for me, but hey, you know, I've worked around it. Uh, but the main way that I do remember things is visually. And I remember, like, fan art submissions especially. And a couple that we got, um, like, there was one from uh, someone named uh, Katie. And uh, they submitted a... Uh, fan art of the uh, Crested Buka. It was for a Halloween fun fact. And this is like 2002, I think. Uh, but there's really incredible artwork of a Crested Buka, um, you know, like holding a lantern. I can't remember exactly what the, the scenario was that, that, you know, they drew this picture. But, you know, every time we got a piece of fan art that was like approaching professional level, uh, it was a big event. Like the community was like, oh my gosh, look at this, everybody look at this. And everybody just gets together, like gathers <laughs> around, like, holy crap. Uh, and that happened on a regular basis, which I loved. That was one of my favorite things is like getting a really incredible new piece of fan art. Um, and one artist in particular uh, stood out. Um, their name was Sean Witt. And we contacted them when we were working on the Earthbound Anthology. And like the art that they had done prior to that was so sparse, but so high quality that they were the very first person we thought of when we thought, okay, we need to make a cover for this book that's going to like sum up the entire community's like uh, aspirations over the past decade. Um, and so Sean put together this illustration for the book. And I just, it's probably one of my favorite art pieces of all time. Uh, just because it meant so much to me then. Um, and because even today, it's still just incredibly good. Like, just uh, extremely uh, high bar <laughs> of quality on this art. Uh, and I'm trying to think if and where that's uh, available. I think it's on Starman.net, so I'll have to look it up and see. Maybe you can add it to, you know, some show notes or something. But um, the, those, those are two pieces in particular that stand out to me. It's like, oh my gosh, these... Uh, you know, whenever whenever I see them, like, you know, I'll keep copies of the drive, you know, like sometimes it'll be a wallpaper uh, on, you know, a machine or a phone or whatever. And uh, that kind of, you know, I, I have to, I do that every couple of years, like, oh yeah, I got to put that book back up as a wallpaper so I can kind of refresh it in my memory. <laughs> That's so sweet to hear about. <laughs> yeah. It's good to know that, like, that stuff gets preserved, you know, just like you have a whole decade right. of your history and just, just a book. And now I'm starting to think, well, what if our site lives for that long? And it's like, well, you know, you have all everything, you know, you keep going. <laughs> yeah, and that's an important thing to remember is that, like, the the stuff that you... Like, I guess the best way to say it is you don't know what's going to stick. Yeah. And that's why it's so important to just try to keep the same level of investment and quality on everything that you mm -hmm. do. And... By doing that, you make it kind of a foregone conclusion that it will stick and it will persist over the years. Um, so it's a it's a it's a good virtuous cycle to yeah. get into. That's that's one of the things that I like so far about our our uh, our content is uh, we do these interviews with just anybody in the community that we know that happens to like Earthbound, you know, or happens to be associated with it or, or, or something. So. It's always something, you know, when I, I, I told she says this in our previous interview, you know, every time I play Earthbound, I learn something new. Well, every time I do an interview, I learn something new about the person that we talk to. So I think that in itself is an experience that's not only on a historical level, but, you know, it's just it's just something neat to experience with just these folks that we come far in between. You know, Jeff Man, we talked to about the Mother 3 fan translation. Now we're talking to Reed Man, who made this huge Starman.net community. So it's, you know, like, what's next? <laughs> what man is yeah. next? <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's also, it's also important to remember, and this was something that I really didn't appreciate until long after the fact. But, like, 
you never know when someone who is not, uh, you know, is not prominent in any way um, will go on to do something just absolutely phenomenal. Like with, with Toby, like oh, yeah. Toby, uh, mm-hmm. Toby Fox of Undertale. Like he, yeah. he was, he was definitely a prominent part of the community. Um, but we had nobody, obviously nobody knew what he was going to go on to do. Like it wasn't yeah. possible to know that back then. Um, and we just loved having him around because he was such a, a goofball. You know, he was so fun to hang out with and like forming those communities with the people that you've got around you, uh, is really important. And, you know, like there, there are other communities that I've kind of witnessed from afar. You know, I, I've never really been involved in many other communities besides Earthbound, but I definitely have lurked or just followed. And a lot of times you know, you'll see communities, especially younger ones that are starting out. They're trying to think like, okay, how can we establish cloud? How can we get some higher profile <laughs> people involved? How can we really raise things up here? And I think, I feel so strongly that the answer there is that you don't. You work with what you've mm-hmm. got and you make friends with the people who are there. Yeah. And that's really the source of strength. I agree. Like you, you will not get outside people um, or you, you can't like, you can't buy clout, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. You work, you work with what you have. You try, you try new things, you know, you reach out. It doesn't, it, you know, it doesn't have to particularly be for this one particular, you know, one specific thing. So, you know, reaching out mm-hmm. to these folks and just learning about, you know about them but also including them into the community or anything like that it's something to uh, behold you know we have folks in our community right now uh, multivolt you know he's doing this new mother squared project we have sam the salmon which is one of our staff members doing all these sprite related projects um, there's always somebody within our you know group doing something cool and unique and it's just it's it's uh a little overwhelming i would say a little yeah. bit but at the same time <laughs> that's the fun part that's the fun great thing about it like there's so there's an overwhelming amount of content that it just never ends and that's what i want it to be you know so i'm yeah. very thankful for you know people like bones and echoes and and cody and you and it just it never ends and that's what i want it's forever so yeah i mean i can relate to the, you know the same feeling uh 2007 when ryan haas started the super mario brothers the movie archive it was just a little hub where he uploaded some of the merchandise for the movie he had to preserve it it wasn't really meant to be much more at the time but then some of the crew involved with the movie started reaching out to him then all of a sudden they're helping release the movie on blu-ray then they're making a documentary and now we're making an extended cut it's like no one really knew it would grow to such stature (laughs) you can never predict what's going to happen but you gotta you know keep digging into your passion and uh, keep aiming the bar higher to really uh build something you know it's not one person it's not uh one goal it just it expands of course and even so far with mother forever that's been been happening yeah. at an unprecedented yeah. rate i might yeah, say for sure and you know i'm not i'm not so much into the to the numbers or or stats or anything no i i care more for if people are enjoying themselves if they if they love what we're doing for the for them and then they do the same thing back you know that's that's the important part build off of what mm-hmm. they what they create and we we create something for them too um and it, it's the same thing i said a while ago where you know the community bounces off each other and that's that's what i love yeah you know the a community is very quickly becomes more than some of it especially once people get to know each other and they become familiar with what other people in the community are capable of and what mm-hmm. they're able and willing to do um, you can really make some magic happen, and that's yeah. Uh, I, I love that so much. That was that was one of the things I probably miss most about the community is running the fan fest back in the day, because I I wanted to just have an event like I really liked having time off of school, and so you know we would do these fan fests either in the summer or during winter break, um, or for Halloween sometimes just because Halloween I, I really like Halloween school, 
And so <laughs> I I was basically just challenging everybody. Like, I want everybody to do make cool earthbound stuff. And in order to incentivize that, you know, I just came up with some you know arbitrary prizes and stuff. And that very quickly just kind of spiraled out of control in a great way. And it became very difficult to manage because people were producing so much incredible stuff. And because of that, I had to like counter with, okay, I got to do a better organizing, managing, presenting this information. And then because I did that, the community responded with even more stuff. And you just get these, these cycles going and it's really great. I, lo I love to see where stuff like that ends up. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think I'm gonna move to the next one. Let's go. Uh, how, how was the wait for Mother Three? Uh, was seeing Mother Sixty Four come and go disappointing? And how did the community at Starman at the time react to Mother Sixty Four and the wait for Mother Three? <laughs> Boy, it was uh, the the Earthbound community's uh, reputation for being long suffering really forged. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> uh, because I, I I very distinctly remember um, Earthbound sixty four. It was teased. It was talked about. You know, it was in, it was in Nintendo Power. You know, they were talking about it coming soon. And very slowly, it dawned on us that maybe this wasn't necessarily a done deal. Uh, like I said, you know, we had we had very extremely limited uh, understanding or access to Japan at the time. So we, we had no way of knowing what was going on in reality regardless. And so all we had to go on was what we got from Nintendo Power. And so in Nintendo Power, it sounded like, all right, this is happening. And then I don't even remember how the transition happened. If I remember correctly, it started just not appearing on the most wanted list, even though it was like, you know, like one, two or three, and, you know, in the previous issue, like, wait, did, did people seriously just not stop wanting Earthbound 64? <laughs> like, what happened? Um, like, okay, don't worry, it's probably a fluke, it'll be in the next one, Don't, it's fine. Um, and that dawning realization this was not happening, or at least we were worried that something was going on. Like, when the bomb dropped and we, we heard about the cancellation, um, I believe it was actually in the middle of our petition, the Earthbound 64 petition. <laughs> Because oh, wow. we were worried, like we we anticipated, like oh my gosh, is this? Are they going to cancel this game? Like what's going to happen? And we were so concerned about it that we started the petition proactive. And then right in the middle of it, uh, the, the news hit, and so you know it was it was kind of too little, too late. But also, you know, in retrospect, we had no chance of influencing. Like we couldn't move the needle on NCL canceling an incredibly expensive project like that. You know, that was just not in our hands. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the cancellation was definitely a little devastating, but it was also kind of vital for the community because it provided this pivot point or I don't want to say common enemy because that sounds a little too negative, <laughs> but it provided this opportunity for us to all have this one focus, like we got to get this game. Like we got to do something like we have to, right. we have to scream real loud <laughs> in order for this to be fixed. Um, so that was, that was a really, um, it was very uh, emotional. I mean, it, it wasn't emotional in terms of like people weeping and gnashing of teeth or anything, but like it was emotional and kind of uh, form, like formational for us, I guess is the weird word I would use to describe that because it, it set the stage for the stuff that we would do in the future there to say like, okay, we are... Um, like, this is who we are. We are fans of this game that has this really rough history that may never come out, may never see the light of the day. But in spite of that, we're going to persist. We're going to keep trying to make this happen. And, like, even if it doesn't happen, we're still going to celebrate it and, you know, get whatever information we can. And just working with what scraps we got, um, I think that really helped shape our attitudes and our approach to stuff in a much more healthy way. And we became it's it's kind of like we became like it, it it became our problem to ensure our continued existence i guess <laughs> it's like we're not gonna get this outside validation or content or you know whatever we wanted um and if we're gonna be happy with something we're gonna have to provide it ourselves essentially 
It's that it's that bad news bearsedness almost. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like that that in retrospect was very healthy for us because we didn't get to just kick back and get fed you know grapes from the vine as we're you know fan <laughs> by Nintendo. <laughs> uh, and that was that was that was a good development I think. Um, and so obviously I'm glad that Mother Three ultimately came out. But even if it didn't. Um, I think the community would have survived because we, like, in that period, you know, roughly like 1999 to 2005 or so, we really learned how to do things for ourselves. And that really echoed in everything that came after. It was like, you know, the fact that we were so primed to make our own, enter own entertainment, and our own arts, and our own music and stuff. Uh, prepared us for what we ultimately ended up doing with the fan translation and then kind of going into fan game. Like a lot of Starman people ended up working on fan gamer. Um, and that was also born out of that kind of do it yourself uh, ethic. So, so we now know the Earthbound community as a DIY expert. That's 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 great. <laughs> yes, that's great to know. It really is. <laughs> uh, it, it, and it, yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that mindset or anything because I, I've seen. Bless my heart, because I've seen I've seen so many DIY projects on YouTube. Some of them, they're all right. Some of them, but you know, you know, <laughs> it, it's 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 funny you mention that because there, there's there again, you know, back to the whole community thing. You're absolutely right. They they just learn to it it's it when people describe Earthbound to me like outside of the community they, they you know just it's a it's a forgotten series and they describe it like a wasteland like like a Fallout and I'm like no it's nothing like that if you if you actually get in there you would see a lot of amazing projects involved with it right now so it's it <laughs> it's one of those series yeah. And part of the reason that I use uh, do it yourself, which has kind of taken on a different um, meaning uh, now, but like I think it was around 2005 or 2006, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, I think the website's still up. It was uh, starman.net slash devotion. Mm -hmm. And it was just basically a page that's, um, that I put together with a lot of help from Clyde and a couple other folks, but it was basically us announcing the like, you know what? Screw it. We're going to translate this game ourselves because they're not going to do it for us. Um, and we called it Do-It-Yourself Devotion. Um, and that was just kind of a weird, you know, like, I guess, marketing name. And we never thought about the stuff that we did as marketing. Um, but, that, you know, that was how we marketed this. Is like, all right, the fans are going to do it for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so Do-It-Yourself kind of really became a, a central theme of the Earthbound community during that time. From, like, roughly 2006 to, uh, you know, 2010 or so, I would say. Okay. That's that's something I never even knew that was a thing because we we had just wrote about the Mother Three fan translation page and and uh, I briefly skimmed through it but I don't was that was that a detail that was included Echoes that was yeah oh, yeah okay, it's, it's in there yeah. I never <laughs> I, I... <laughs> there's like a good paragraph and a half oh okay <laughs> okay so I need to I need to yeah. fully read that page then when I get the chance but that's really cool huh yeah well yeah, previously a... we heard. Uh, you know Jeffman's perspective, so it was a little bit uh, different. Now we got the inside perspective on what do-it-yourself devotion was. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, and there's a lot of uh, little pages tucked around Starman.net too that a lot of people either don't know about or have completely forgotten about uh, that are pretty interesting. So. Yeah, first thing yeah. that comes to mind is uh, the Blue Disc Saga. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, Blue Disc was one of them. And there was also, um, I think the URL is starman.net slash ebvc, which was a page that I put together. Like, a lot of these pages that were like starman.net slash whatever were pages that I put together when I was really, like, amped up and often frustrated with either, <laughs> like, Nintendo or the games media. <laughs> you know? so, yeah. <laughs> And so the, the copyright lawyers is one of the header lines on this page, the EBVC one. Oh, is it? Is it boy, you know, I haven't actually looked at it in a long time. Let me pull it up here. It's good. All of them are still around. Or, uh, Starman.net slash cult is still around. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> the Avsdota page is still around. Uh-huh. <laughs>
So yeah, there's there is like you said a collection of these these kind of one off pages that we had purpose built mm -hmm. to help us achieve this goal or that, and like Earthbound on VC um, or Stumble.net slash EBVC was a page that we built when we realized that the game like Earthbound was probably not coming to the virtual console, and I was so mad I was like. This sucks. <laughs> like people need to know about this. I'm mad. Everybody else get mad. Come on, let's make some noise. <laughs> and that was kind of the, uh, you know, for better or worse, that was the the foundation of that particular uh, page settling on the, the side. seeds of rebellion just right there in that one page. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh man. Well, I guess this this kind of leads into the next question was um, so. Was it a natural progression to move on from Starman.net and focus more on, on your company, Fangamer? And uh, when Fangamer was first conceptualized, wh what were your initial goals in creating it, and did those goals change over a, over a period of time? Yeah, it was... Boy, it was... It was you know, my, my own internal uh, thought process on it changed quite a bit over time. But initially, uh, Fangamer was very much built basically to support Starman. Like, what, what happened was, at the time, I a freelance web designer. Uh, I, was, I was not making ends meet. Like, you know, I, I had just enough work coming in to, like, cover rent, but I was going into debt. Um, and because I was between jobs so often, I would just spend my time working on Starman.net, uh, partly because, uh, you know, I didn't have more important stuff to do but also because there was some really interesting exciting stuff happening at the time like the mother three fan translation you know the earthbound on the virtual console um you know the do-it-yourself devotion the uh, anthology like all of these projects were happening constantly um and a lot of them were things that i started because i was really feeling strongly about this and the community wanted to see it happen um and I realized, I was like, oh, gosh, like I'm spending so much of my time on the site um, and I can't afford food. <laughs> that was basically where I was at. I was like, okay, I want to find a way to like make this healthier and make it sustainable for me because I knew I couldn't keep it up. Like I was, it was, it was really irresponsible what I was doing. You know, I, my, my family was just, you know, my wife, Camille, she was a, a member of the community as well. And she understood. It's not like she, you know, was begrudged begrudging my involvement in the community um but i knew i was like this this can't this can't last too much longer like i don't want to have to step away from the site again and so i started talking to the staff about the possibility of finding a way to make it self-sustaining and actually support a staff like with payroll uh and that seems that was like many things at the time where it's like can we actually pull this off like that seems a little too much of a stretch um, which made me want to do it even more. Like, I love stupid challenges like that. And so I decided to go for it. And that was how Fangamer started. Like, the goal was to take what we had done for Earthbound and the community that we had built for Earthbound and help um, establish communities like that for other games, like Chrono Trigger, Super Mario RPG, and, of course, also to improve the community that was already existing for Earthbound. And so that was that was the very first iteration of Fangamer, and that's why the forum software that you see when you go to the for, the Starman.net forum, um, it, you can tell that it's it's a lot more advanced than the site itself, and that's because you know Starman.net that you see when you go to the website right now, I built uh, I and a couple other folks built a lot of that and around like 2003, like the vast majority of the design, the programming, the technology, and everything is from 2003 2004 era. Mm -hmm. Um, but the forum was actually uh, something that Ryan and I, Ryan's my co-founder, Rowfish, what's his name in the community. Um, but Ryan and I built the forum from scratch uh, around 2008 or so. And so the forum was like the first building block that we were going to use to establish these other communities for other games. And the goal was to just see what we can do with, with advertising. Like get some banner ads up there, see if we can sell some ads and try to, try to make that pay the bills, keep the lights on, so that we can continue to build software to establish like wikis and um, you know, like big, big meaty sites full of content to, to attract community for other games. And it turns out uh, after like 
we built the form software in about five or six months and uh we flipped the switch and we started putting out the banner ads and stuff and it turns out you cannot make a living selling advertising <laughs> so it's not not 2008 and i imagine it's still probably equally impossible um and so when we realized like oh crap this is not gonna work like we can't we one person can't make a living on this much less two and that was really the goal was like okay if ryan and i can both make a living on this we can we can take it from there but we couldn't even it would support mm. one person and so we're like all right well what do we do now and that's when we pivoted to merchandise we said okay well you know like john john was one of the co-founders of fangamer uh and sorry if you hear my daughter screeching in the background uh <laughs> getting close to bedtime so <laughs> um <laughs> So John was another one of the co-founders of Fangamer, and for years he had run Starman's uh, cafe press shop, just you know, like selling merchandise with Starman Net, net you know, memes and logos and you know, Earthbound stuff, uh, and just you know, cafe press. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's still around or not. I haven't actually looked for a while, but it was you know one of the earliest iterations of print-on-demand, like crappy, low-quality print-on-demand stuff that Redbubble does nowadays. Um, and John had always maintained that. And he did an incredible job. He was very motivated to make fun, cool designs. And so, you know, we worked with John to establish a couple designs, really with the goal of just, like, buying us time to figure out what to do with fan game. Um, and it turns out that selling merchandise is a much, much better business uh, objective than selling advertising. And that was really uh, how Fangamer became a merchandise company, is that it was... It was us pivoting away from banner ads and trying to figure out what to do next. And it turns out, well, hey, that's that's the answer right there. So I don't I don't know if that actually answered the question. You have to restate the question um, for me. It, it was, it was um, <laughs> the question was was it was a natural process to move on from Starman Donna and focus more on Fangamer. And then the other two questions was when Fangamer was first conceptualized. Um, what were your initial goals in creating it, and did those girls goals change over time? I think you answered the last two. I'm not so much sure about the progression moving from Starman on that and focus on Fam Gamer. I think, I think your ideal was more or less saying that you needed to find ways of making a stable income for yourself, and mm -hmm. that was the more focused moving forward was. Fo focusing on a stable income and then also keeping the lights on for Starman.net and all other communities that you were you were developing. So, yeah, I think actually you answered those questions. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and that was and that was one of the big recurring themes early years on Fan Game was that like I was I was still doing Starman.net stuff and I you know I really established Fangamer with Starman.net in mind. Like I wanted to ensure that I could continue to work and focus on uh, Starman.net without, you know, having to like sacrifice <laughs> my, you know, my my own well-being. Um, and it was it was kind of a strange um, kind of a strange dichotomy because like in order to return my focus to Starman.net, I had to make sure Fangamer was okay. In order to make Fangamer okay, I had to give it my entire focus, really. And so, in order to establish Fangamer, I ended up ne not neglecting Starman.net, but just doing a less um, like community-driven, community-focused stuff as I worked desperately to make sure Fangamer was going to survive. And, you know, it took a solid probably six years for Fangamer to get to, into a position where I was like, okay, this is a going concern now. This is not going to go under, you know, like we're not living uh, hand to mouth. Well, I mean, we, we were kind of hand to mouth, but it wasn't like desperately dangerous <laughs> times at all times for Fangamer. Um, and then by the time we got there with Fangamer and it was, it was, you know, safe enough that I, I didn't have to work seven days a week, 12 hour days every day. Um, Starman.net had, it hadn't like puttered out, but it was really like, things were a little bit different and, uh, it was becoming clear that like, you know, what I was doing with Fangamer was really, it was, a, I was beginning to, like, we had a staff of, I don't know, probably like almost, uh, eight or nine people at that point. And I was responsible 
for them and for their livelihoods. And it's like, okay, well, I could either make sure I keep showing up fan gamer and ensure that like this company can continue to exist, or I can go back and do Starman.net stuff. And that was a point at which it was like, okay, it, it would it would definitely be irresponsible now because you know by this point I had my first daughter. Um, I was like, okay, I can't I can't justify neglecting fan gamer in order to do this you know cool Starman.net stuff that I wanted to do. Uh, and it was a really weird place to be because I wanted to tell the community that I wanted to be like, hey guys. I know I kind of ghost, I didn't really ghost, but like I stopped being as involved in order to do fan gamer, but don't worry. I still like Earthbound. I still like the community. Um, but I think the community kind of moved on at the same time that I did. I, I don't, I don't think there was a lot of people who were like, who were like waiting around for me or anything like people, you know, people started doing their own thing. And this was as over this time, social media was really becoming a thing. And that started providing this infrastructure that uh, Starman.net and the forum used to provide for the Earthbound community. And so it was, uh, it was a, it was a pretty okay case of timing there. Like, you know, if this had happened five years earlier than it did, uh, there would have been this big gap where the community wouldn't have had a place to go if there was no like active Starman.net, you know, really pushing to make things happen. Right. But thanks to Twitter and you know the other social media places, we'll kind of you know, went off to, uh, I think it survived partly because yeah. of that. I think, I think that's right. a really big key point is like, so when we, in, we initially conceptualized mother forever, we did not expect our Twitter account or our YouTube account to get hit like as fast as, uh, it did. And, uh, we give a lot of gratitude for that particularly because we know how social media functions for most people. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a forums and I'm surprised that that form gets hits every day. It, it's not like, you know, yeah. it's a, it's a, it's a program, you know, it, it's a modernized version of forms. We use them for as our, as our backend. And then I did some customization on it, but you know, it, it it's funny how we, you know, it doesn't it doesn't appear well that particular program doesn't appear as foreign because we've made it in such a way that it, it looks like a social media site for earthbound people so uh when it comes to like twitter and facebook it, it it's one of those things where a lot of people particularly use that more than just like you know a fan site or whatever you know that's why we make youtube videos to get all of our information out because while we have preserved all this information on, on, a, on a big website um i i get the feeling that some people are more comfortable with you know youtube or you know v vimo or, or twitch or, or something else and and that's because you know those are big standing companies and also probably a little bit more reliable in terms of stability so i can i can definitely understand the switch between you know you're you're wanting to do more stuff with starman.net but then you realize that you have other obligations that you have to do and that's where that shift is and the community could probably understand that that way too because i've seen the community sort of shift in the same direction you know social media has become such a very very strong uh platform that these forms and you know standardized websites don't provide anymore but i still think that there's a place for them because it's a way of preserving that information, not for historical value, but also just for somebody to just glance and look and learn. You know, I think that information can help somebody who's making, I don't know, say a documentary or a video on YouTube or a theory of some sort or, or, or whatever. So we do our job just as much as everyone else does who's doing their own thing outside. Yeah, and it's it is so important to to fill the role that you guys are filling and that Starman.net used to fill, mm -hmm. um, which is like taking these things that are too either either too complex or too niche to exist and survive on other sites, and also protecting these things from for-profit companies who may not have an interest in keeping it around. Like for example, uh, you know we started. Like video was always a challenge because like hosting video was virtually impossible, uh, partly because of bandwidth concerns, partly just because you know you couldn't have video playing in a browser, 
mm -hmm. back in the day. And so when we first started putting Starman.net video content onto YouTube, it was kind of a cautious thing. We're like, it's nice that YouTube hosts these videos, but what happens if YouTube goes under or something happens or they decide, all right, you know, we're just going to cut off all this old stuff or stuff that doesn't get hits anymore and just make it disappear. And so we really kind of took it upon ourselves to be archivists and to like protect and help make sure this information could survive, you know, you know, beyond whatever website we were, you know, that was convenient at the time. And, uh, you know, like there, there was a, a site back in the day uh, called Dig. And it was basically, it's kind of like Reddit, essentially. And uh, Dig became big enough that we actually made it a, a part of our Starman.net front page where you could click a button to like uh, upvote you know, our news links on Dig. And I don't remember, you know, how conscious the decision was, but eventually we ripped those out because it was just kind of weird to have this, you know, external websites, you know, integration into Starman.net. And I, I think about that sometimes, like, I'm really glad that Starman.net was able to uh, survive and not get washed away with all this other stuff on the internet and also not surrender what it had done and its kind of mission to uh to other like for-profit companies uh, and so i think that's a really important aspect of like mother forever is that you know you guys are taking this and you're doing this thing uh, and it's a service that's not like you're doing things that are not going to happen on wikia for example like a lot of the stuff that you do is stuff that just you know you can't you can't do on somebody else's website for whatever reason. uh and so i i do want to encourage that like that that really is important to keep in mind that like um, you know, being in control of your own fate is very important for a website and a community. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the more you relinquish your, your content freedom to say YouTube or any other site, the more, uh, accessibility you lose. I mean, I remember back in like, oh, seven, oh, eight, when YouTube had, you know, you can customize your background, you can customize your icon, yeah. you can customize the the opacity of the of the front layer and the back layer, and I'm like, where did that all go? Where now we have everyone looks the same. Everyone has this banner. Everyone mm -hmm. has this icon. Everyone has a home page. Devoured by Google. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I guess. Yeah, and, and that's the thing is that like you know having having the on community was able to move to Twitter because that's really where I saw a lot of the community end up. Um, but I was always you know kind of ambivalent about it because I'm glad that the community survives and they can still talk and hang out and stuff on their own terms. But it atomized it and it kind of blew it up in this way that's like it's convenient for Twitter to be able to absorb you know this traffic and this information and whatnot but it's not necessarily good for the community. And so knowing that, you know, you guys are there and, you know, providing the service again that Starman.net used to provide is uh, kind of a comfort. Yeah, I definitely think Twitter is, is where that landed. I think when we were running the um, Mother of Earth, I was looking at metrics a while back, like years ago, about how much traffic was coming in from places for like the Kickstarter when it was running. And Twitter was, like, a good 60% of our traffic, I think, mm -hmm. which is absolutely insane. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, Twitter Twitter is a really powerful tool in that way. Um, and it's just a question of, like, all right, so what happens if the tide shifts? Like, if, you know, like, if, if I was still running Starman.net as a, as a going thing today... You know, one of the things we would be grappling with is like, okay, when we've got content that's Twitter-based, like Marcus Lindblom tweets about something that's relevant to the Earthbound series or whatever, how do we get that information and preserve yeah. it? Because we, you know, I've learned over and over again, you cannot trust uh, a for-profit company to, uh, to not only like maintain whatever thing that is on there, but to continue to make it accessible to you through APIs or whatever. Like, if it's not on your server, who knows? And you should really assume that it will, it can and will disappear. Um, and Link Rot, you know, that was that was a pretty serious thing. And that was one of the reasons that I wanted Fangamer to 
survive so that Starman.net and its server could survive. And after a couple of years of Fangamer like becoming established, Fangamer started paying the bills because Starman.net used to run on donation. Uh, and it was just strictly like, you know, if we, we the only money that we brought in was from people who wanted to have a badge. And that turned out to be exactly enough that, you know, to, to pay the server bills each month. But as the site waned, that became uh, endangered. And so that's one of the things that Fangamer has been able to do, continues to do for Starman.net, is to basically just keep it alive. Like Fangamer pays all the server bills and Ryan, my co-founder, still gets in there from time to time uh, and, you know, messes with this or that setting to make sure, you know, the server is secured. Um, you know, we've still got uh, Sarsi gets in there every once in a very rare while to apply a new patch to make sure, you know, we don't have uh, people get in through a back door in PHP or whatever. So. Yeah. Uh, speaking of some of your old Starman Donut friends, on to the next question. Do you still keep in contact with many of the Star Starman Donut veterans now that you work more on Fangamer? Have any approached you to work on Fangamer on new projects they've developed? Uh, yes, it happens all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and it's great. I love it when it happens. Um, and sometimes it happens out of the blue. Like... Uh, several times now I've been working with someone for years and they'll be like, Hey, by the way, I don't know if you knew this, but I used to go on Starman.net or I used to be like a huge bound fan, whatever. Um, and that happened in particular with the forum software. Like it was kind of a funny, you know, roundabout thing, but the, the forum software we built for Fangamer and or for, for Starman.net, you know, it was Fangamer forum software. And we ended up licensing it to Guild Wars to use for, or sorry, to ArenaNet to use for Guild Wars 1 and 2. And at the end of that project, you know, one of the project leads from ArenaNet, we went, we went to the launch party for Guild Wars 2, and we're just kind of hanging out, talking to the project lead. He's like, by the way, uh, I'm not, I don't think I told you guys this, but I'm, I'm a huge Earthbound fan. I was actually the guy that uh, did the Zero Day for the Mother 3 ROM. <laughs> and like, her <laughs> jaw dropped to the ground, and we just like, we couldn't speak. <laughs> I was just so gobsmacked. I was like, why didn't you tell us? Like, what are you waiting for? <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, we ended up talking for uh, like uh, an hour, an hour and a half or so at this party, just learning about all the stuff that this guy had done in the Earthbound community that for some reason he didn't tell us about until <laughs> until we were finished with launching this huge forum site. Um, and like I said, that happens all the time. Like, I just interviewed somebody for a position at Fangamer. Um, who lurked Starman.net through, you know, a big chunk of the 2000s. Um, and that, that kind of thing happens frequently. Like somebody, you know, I'm working with somebody or talking to somebody, whatever. And they're like, yeah, by the way, I'm a huge Earthbound fan. I don't know if you still are involved with the site. It's like, oh, I mean, I kind of am, kind of not, but that's <laughs> really good to hear. And I'm really glad to hear that, you know, people still have fond memory of what they did with the community or for the community back in the day. Yeah, that's pretty incredible that even though you may not be hands-on with the site quite as much anymore, uh, you still have those relationships and even su surprisingly uh, new ones that, you know, didn't quite come to be at the time, but now can flourish in this uh, new era of your life. <laughs> not many get that chance for sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm incredibly lucky, you know, to, to have, I mean, just the the success of Fangamer and the community that um, was really there, especially at the beginning, you know, like without the Starman community, Fangamer just would not have happened. And I would be, you know, off either doing freelance design still or just grinding it out at like, you know, one of, one of the Joe jobs that I considered taking before I launched Fangamer. Um, and I, I'm just eternally grateful to everybody who was there for um, and it's so hard to express that sometimes, but I, I do love when people who are who are around for the Starman community or for the early fan gamer stuff, when they reach out and just tell me about stuff they remember or stuff they were involved in, or even just you know merchandise that they bought, um, you know that really that really does does my heart good to hear those stories and get to interact with people and just hang out and talk. Um, and a lot of times that ends up you know. Like, oh, well, hey, what do you do now? And they're like, oh, yeah, well, I do art and design or I do programming or whatever. Like, do you 
do you need a gig? Like, can you can you do a job for us? <laughs> and that that happens on a pretty regular basis, which uh, is also very cool. That's awesome to hear. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I still hold on to a lot of my old fan gamer merchandise. <laughs> I love I love uh, a lot of that, a lot of the stuff that you have there. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, and you know, just like I said, my memory is bad, so sometimes people. You're like, oh, check this thing out. I, I've got from early days in the fan game. We're like, boy, I did not remember that we even made that. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so people bringing that to me is very helpful for keeping my memory alive on this stuff. So. Yeah, one of my biggest regrets in life for certain is not getting the Earthbound Saga DVD. Oh, you know what? <laughs> there may still be one floating around the warehouse. I'll have to check with Jazzy on <laughs> well, Actually, I could when, definitely give it a good home. <laughs> when when we moved into our latest office, um, I opened a file cabinet, uh, you know, because I was just emptying out this big file cabinet just so we could it'd be easier to push, you know, push out the door. And I uncovered this giant stash of Happy Video Game Nerd DVDs. Oh my and, god! And like we had no idea that they were in there, and they've been there for like seven years. <laughs> Oh, yeah, he yes. doesn't even go by that name anymore. <laughs> no, he doesn't. Yeah, Stop Skeleton from Fighting is the kid oh, now. Man. It was very, it was very funny to discover like like 60 DVDs just chilling out in this drawer that we accidentally misplaced. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think you actually messaged me about like you said you had all this like Earthbound merchandise or something just chilling in there that needs to be raffled or whatever. I never got back to you on that, but... Yeah, that, that's that's kind of crazy how you just, you know, you have all this stuff that you kind of hoarded over the years and then you just find finally, like, open up and you're like, oh, that's where that was, <laughs> you know? I, I misplaced a lot of things in my own office right now because of Mother Forever. I got so many files and stuff all, all around. <laughs> yeah, and we've, you know, we gathered, basically the way it worked was that, you know, during Starman.net, I would keep what I could. You know, because like I, I wasn't like, I wasn't really a pack rat, but every once in a while I'd squirrel away something cool or you know uh, something that I thought I would really appreciate in the future. And so I had a decent, I had a couple like bankers boxes worth of files from Starman.net over the years, and a big chunk of that was like envelope that uh, you know that we uh, submitted to Nintendo Power. And um, other things were just cool little trinkets that you know had kind of washed up. Uh, on on the shore, you know, that we just ended up gathering from one place or another. Like, you know, one guy, like one guy was basically like renouncing worldly possessions and he ended up giving us a bunch of copies of Mother 3. And so we ended up you know, using those over the course of a couple of years and just like using them for charity raffles or for prizes or whatever. Um, and stories like that would happen all the time. Like somebody would be like, hey, you know, like I, uh, you know, I used to love Earthbound, and I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I used to get married. My wife wants to get rid, get rid of all this junk, and here's, uh, here's my mock piece of air freshener. Like, holy crap, really? <laughs> 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 and so, you know, I've got, I've got a couple boxes worth of stuff, and uh, the mat, the, the biggest chunk of that stuff is actually the plush trust fund, which is just a bunch of Earthbound plushies that's a Japanese fan who is just like preternaturally skilled at crane games one back when earthbound merchandise was in crane games in japan um and so this is it's like dozens of plush and figurines um i think it's mostly like band presto stuff oh yeah and so you know right. we auctioned off what we could but there's still a bunch uh and so i would i'd be glad to hand that off to a to a new home so you guys can help make sure it gets uh used for good charity yeah, purposes like one of the things that we actually want to do with uh all the earthbound merchandise is uh actually make individual doc like kind of like mini documentaries about the, the piece like what 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 they were used for what what you know like manufacturer or stuff like that and then you know kind of like display them what where you can find them what what price is typically the brand presto stuff unfortunately because they are claw they're like they're you know the claw game they are raising up in price um and then mm. there was a very recent thing that was in uh it was in New York, I think in January or maybe February, I don't remember. They had like uh, yeah, it was a there was showcase, a showcase right? with Bandai. 
and they showcased Earthbound stuff. All of this Earthbound merchandise of Ban Presto and everything. And we were under the impression that this stuff was going to get reprinted. Because if, if they, they wouldn't have put it on display if, it, if that wasn't the case. They had all these other Nintendo stuff too. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I feared about was if this stuff's getting reprinted, the originals are going to skyrocket in price. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. So do we, is that going through? Is we that don't know. That's just, that's just an assumption that we came up with. But we found out that that was... Yeah that was a thing that happened in like late late february in new york so uh we'll see <laughs> we'll see yep <laughs> well hey the, you know the, the reason that we called it the plus trust fund is that back when we first received this massive cache of earthbound merchandise like this was like i want to say it was like four pretty huge boxes mm -hmm. full of stuff and i realized even at the time you know like it was uh, you know the prices I'm sure were much lower than they are now right. but I was like there's so much stuff here and this stuff is going to keep appreciating the value that if we auction off a little bit each year it'll just perpetually be worth the same amount of money yeah. and we can just keep giving to charity you know <laughs> like constantly forever <laughs> um, or at least until until we auction the very last thing which is going to take right. forever you know and so uh, hopefully that's uh, kind of like Moore's Law I hope that prediction stays true and we can keep auctioning this stuff for a very long time yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That'd be that'd be something to look into, especially with like you know charity things. Like that was one of the things mm -hmm. we wanted to do at some point. Not not like in the foreseeable future currently, but maybe later down the line, like you know, extra life or or, or some sort of like Earthbound bash or whatever. I think somebody approached us. I think the person was named. Linkachu or something. Yeah. I don't remember their name. Remember. They said yeah. that they wanted to do a whole month of Earthbound stuff in May called Mother May. And I was like, yeah, that that sounds right. You know, that sounds good. But unfortunately, they, they approached me in March when I was deathly sick. <laughs> so, you know, um, <laughs> it, was, it, it was okay timing, but also not okay timing, if that makes any sense. But, uh, Definitely an idea oh, for the yeah. future. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I would love to do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, for sure. But uh, it's funny that we, you know, you just mentioned charity stuff, and that was stuff that we already had thought about too. Well, you know, when it came to making this project. But uh, there's there's some other little successful projects that Cody would like to talk about that had formed oh, from yeah. Starman. <laughs> uh... Right. Yeah. You you touched on this mm -hmm. before. Um, there were there are a lot of people in the starman.net community that have gone on to create a lot of successful projects um and toby fox and his games are some of them um as a part of fan gamer how has it been to work with uh toby on merchandise for his games it's been really interesting um because you know when toby first came to us like i remember when he he gave me a heads up that he was going to be releasing a demo for his game and I remembered him, you know, releasing the Halloween hack, which I just loved. Um, and so I was really excited to see what he would do with this, you know, his own original property. And so um, I said, like, hey, if you need help with the Kickstarter, let us know. You know, we would love to you know, just fulfill whatever merchandise you need for the Kickstarter. Um, and I figured we'd probably put out like a shirt or maybe two shirts uh, for the game when it, when it eventually came out. <laughs> and obviously, you see how that went, like just... <laughs> worldwide yeah. phenomenon just uh, you know even to this day we have never quite seen anything like that initial wave of demand from undertale um like we've been involved in three of the five biggest video game kickstarters in history and still in spite of that like the first wave of undertale demand just dwarfs everything <laughs> so, <laughs> which is just it's weird to say because it's just it's undertale it was just toby you know, Toby and his goofy uh, sprites and stuff, you know, like it was uh, something something very neat about Toby that I didn't fully appreciate at the time was how willing he was to focus on the core and the story and the stuff that people would really get pulled into deep to the exclusion of the aesthetics. Like I remember when I first played Undertale, I was like, so when are you going to replace some of this art? He's like, that's, that's final, man. <laughs> that's how it looks. 
that's the game. <laughs> uh, and, you know, in retrospect, I, I really appreciate that decision uh, so much more because uh, I recognize that Toby, Toby knew that it didn't matter. I mean, you know, it mattered a little bit how stuff looked, but for the most part, you know, the, the value of the game and the characters was in the writing and in the experience right. and you know the way that you interacted and you see them interacting with each other and whatnot and it's not about cool animations or great character design or shading or coloring or any of that stuff um and so knowing you know that toby had the the prescience to to focus on that uh, i was like oh dang boy he's really he he's he's been well positioned for the success that he's had you know, because he knows what to focus on, um, yeah, right? And I, you know, I've really learned to appreciate that more as we've worked him over the years. Um, is to to be like, all right, you know, if Toby, if Toby's first response or first instinct is to not do something, at, early on we'd be like, well, come on, I mean, think about it this way. What if we do this, or what if we try to do this? You know, and if uh, you know, we would sometimes we wouldn't like fight or anything, but we would just like press, like, come on, why don't, why don't you think about doing like releasing this kind of merchandise or whatever? Um, but in the years since the game first came out, we've realized, all right, Toby knows exactly what makes sense for his game and his community and for the merchandise that he wants to see. And we have uh, we have basically stopped pushing anything. It's like, all right, Toby wants to do it, we'll do it, but otherwise, we're not going to pressing. Uh, you know. <laughs> Well, and he that's... draws so much from his, like, own, like, intuition and life experience, too. Because, like, I mean, there's also, it's funny to kind of tie it into this a little bit, but I know that, like, even some of the characters are uh, somewhat nods to people in Toby's life, too. I know mm -hmm. Asgore in particular. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, so having there, there's a couple others as well. There's a couple Starman.net folks in Undertale, or like in you know, I just say that because they're either the name is from you know this person who's from the community, or there's some aspect of their personality you know that's kind of pulled from a, a community person. Yeah. Um, and yeah, yeah, Toby, uh, Toby has been very conscientious about that, and also his profile um, as a member of the community as the game has blown up and yeah. that's that reminds me of one of the really like i want to say i don't want to say painful because that's a little too melodramatic but it, it is kind of painful to, to look back on this that after the game released and really started blowing up toby came to me he emailed me he's like listen i need you to delete my forum posts i remember being in the chat for that oh <laughs> <laughs> it was just heartbreaking wasn't it this... yeah <laughs> Uh, it, and, you know, it's still to this day, actually, just like a month ago. Because, um, yeah, spoiler alert, we did it. We deleted his posts from the forum. Um, and uh, like a month ago, I had to look something up on the forum. And I was looking through this old topic. You know, this is like a 10-year-old forum topic. Actually, it was even older than that. It was like 12 years old or something. And the, we were having this really funny, weird, lively conversation about whatever it was I was looking up. And then there's this big gap in the conversation. Like, oh, that's where Toby yeah. just did. And I really yep. said, mm -hmm. you know, I was like, gosh, this sucks. You know, and that's, I guess that's just one of the, the, the price of fame there is like, you know, you kind of, you kind of lose the, the claim that you have on stuff that you did in the past in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So yeah. A, a, little, a little heartbreaking, but uh, you know what? Uh, I, I'm very, I'm extremely happy for him and I'm glad that we were able to help him out and, cover his tracks there so people wouldn't like data mine his entire life. yeah that's you know? important yeah yeah i was just i was just gonna I, say it. with that amount of fame there are going to be people who are going to look into everything super deeply more than anybody would ever think well and like starman.net i know is a place that like I was in. I was on when I was in high school, and I know Toby was on when he was in high school. So right, like, yeah, and you you never you might not even remember something you posted from then, or you might remember something that you really don't want to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sometimes you might say something that's a little embarrassing or maybe controversial. Or exactly. Like and unfortunately, yeah. you know the way that 
the way that the internet's formed now, yeah, I can understand that uh, development. But however, I do have a question for uh, Re Reed here. You know, your, your inspiration is Asgore, so where's the human souls? <laughs> where, where are they? To find where out. If you we want to find know. out, we will find out. Break them. the barrier and find out. <laughs> <laughs> I've always... I don't even know if this will make the cut or not. I've always had the crazy conspiracy theory, and I've mentioned this to maybe a couple of people. I don't think I've said it publicly, but, like, Ooh. I definitely think that Evan might in some way kind of be Sans. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good theory. <laughs> and I have very little backing on that at all. I have no substantiation, but the basketball shorts and the hoodie... The bad <laughs> ones, the like love of uh, skulls. I don't know. <laughs> After you talked about him and I saw him in the documentary, I was kind of sold on that, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he even has his hands in his pockets while in the documentary the whole time. I'll have, to, I'll have to do a little bit of recon. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let me know. <laughs> Oh man! Yeah, it, it was interesting playing through Undertale with my girls because when we got to the Asgore fight, um, by that time my daughter she was like, I think the first time she played it through she was like three or four, um, and she knew that this character had been based on me, and so uh, it was like she she refused to play like it was my job to play that part of the game. She didn't want to be involved fighting me. <laughs> <laughs> so cute. It was it was very sweet. It was very interesting. Like, oh, this is such a strange position to be in, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, in terms of like other games, how has it been to work with companies like Rare, Konami, SNK, and so many more on chain gamer merchandise? Uh, have there been any been any fun interactions with companies that you've worked with on fan gamer products, or has it been more just business than anything else? It's mostly business, uh, which is a little disappointing to hear myself say, because like, especially like when I was doing Starman.net stuff and, you know, like the conception of Nintendo from the Earthbound fan angle became this gigantic, like part of the Earthbound fan psyche, yeah. <laughs> you know, like this idea of Nintendo as this behemoth. It is out to destroy us. We have to like, you know, we're the we're the rebels, and we gotta, you know, we gotta escape their grasp and jump the light speed or whatever. Um, I guess that's kind of a tortured metaphor, but you know, like we all we all thought of Nintendo as this massive force, this uh, that you know could sometimes be malevolent, sometimes you know hiding things from us or you know doing things that are, you know, we're trying to we're trying to keep them honest and you know trying to stay on top of this or that. Uh, that's been the most interesting aspect of fan gamer for me is like learning about the industry and realizing the truth of the matter, uh, which yeah. is really that the vast majority of people in Nintendo have no idea what Earthbound is and really don't care either way. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's true across companies. Like most companies are filled with people who are just doing their job. Like it's very rare for you to encounter somebody at a company who is they're primarily because they're a huge fan. There, there's a couple, like Sega's got some folks who do that kind of stuff. They're kind of like community um, engagement. Uh, Nintendo has a couple of those, and it's less of an overt thing and more of a just a fact of life that like the treehouse is comprised of people who really love games, love Nintendo. Um, and for that reason, in the treehouse, you'll find most of the people who end up reaching out to a fan community and, you know, providing a little bit of information or like guiding them this direction or that because they understand they're fans themselves and they really love the, the communities that form up. And over the years, you know, like Starman had um, probably four, four or five contacts in the treehouse um, who provided varying levels of information. Uh, once in a while, we get some really juicy bits of information. But for the most part, it was just like, Hey, you know, uh, I don't remember, you know, we, we made contact with them in a variety of ways, but ultimately most of our correspondence with them would be like, Hey, got to keep it, you know, keep it short, keep it, you know, brief and professional here, but I want to let you know this, or you should consider that or don't do this or whatever. Um, and that's pretty rare. Like that's not common. So, you know, like if you're working with 
Bandai Namco on something for Katamari. You know, they're not going to hook you up with their resident Katamari expert. Um, you know, the, the industry equivalent for that kind of thing is a producer. And mm -hmm. so, like, it, you know, as especially as games age, producers, uh, the producer role changes and it gets handed off, you know, from the person who made the game to, you know, maybe the, the studio got bought or they yeah. moved on to do something else or whatever. And it gets kind of handed off. And, and that way, it's interesting to see, like, some IPs stay very strict. And you can tell when you have a hard time getting things approved that you're probably working with people from the original team. It's like, sometimes we'll submit merchandise for things like uh, Metal Gear. And it turns out, you know, sometimes it's very difficult to get things approved for Metal Gear. And, you know, the feedback will come back. Like, you basically submit your designs into the system, and you just wait. And you cross your fingers and hope you get feedback in time to, you know, make changes and, you know, submit again and try to get it finally approved. Yeah. And depending on what you're doing, um, sometimes you get really, really detailed uh, feedback. Like, all right, you know, all this stuff looks good, but if you zoom in on this one corner, there's this little character in the corner and their hair is wrong. You know, the hair is supposed to not look like it's got too much product in it. You know, <laughs> like that level <laughs> of focus. <laughs> And that's when you know, like, okay, we're definitely working with somebody who worked in the original game and they still care and love, you know, they love that game and they want it to be perfect. Um, and then sometimes you'll work on other products where it's like, all right, you can literally do anything you wanted and they'll give it a thumbs up and it will be very easy to get out there. But, you know, that's, uh, that, that's, that's more of a rare situation. Yeah. Um, well, and I think that that's uh, really like, I've always kind of wanted to talk about that a little bit because I, I mean, I've had some games QA experience just working professionally, and like that is it is really eye opening to understand how the industry actually works mm -hmm. uh, when right. you've been embroiled so much in the idea that like Nintendo is closed off and Nintendo has, <laughs> you know, they're constantly thinking about uh, not releasing Mother Three in English. <laughs> 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 yeah yeah that is definitely not the case it's really a matter of like nintendo or companies like nintendo will only think about mother in any capacity if there is a marketing beat associated with it or if there's some kind of pr angle <laughs> to it yeah oh yeah and that's really it and it's not it's not a malicious thing it's just the fact of life yeah, yeah. so you you briefly mentioned konami so now so now we need a we need a snake figure that you can squeeze, and it has David Hater's has David <laughs> Hater's voice is like Colonel, this person's squeezing me, or some something like that. something like that. Just an idea. That that is a fairly convincing David Hater. Thank you. I like it. <laughs> Read Young here. I'm trying yeah, we, to sneak trying around. to sneak around. <laughs> uh, well, anyways. Um, this is a this is a kind of a very big question. I believe you have, but uh, have you ever tried speaking to Mr. Atoy and the Hobonichi company about collaborations between Fangamer and Hobonichi for new mother related projects? Yes, uh, that that remains to this day like one of my overarching goals for the entire company is like we're gonna do Earthbound stuff someday. We're gonna do something. <laughs> Um, and you know, like early on, that was like that was the only goal. Like when Fangamer started, and you know, we switched from form software to merchandise, and it was really Earthbound merchandise because we were, you know, the, the only community or fan base that we had to work with was the Starman.net community. And so we made Earthbound merchandise. And so I, I actually emailed Nintendo right as we were starting up and said, like, hey, I want to talk about like getting officially licensed. I want to make Earthbound merchandise. Um, and they, they got a, uh, I got a one line response. Like it took me a long time to get that, that person's email address. Cause you know, you can't just like walk up and ask somebody like the, the secretary or the front desk at Nintendo, like, Hey, right. uh, who, how do you get a hold of licensing? Like you got, you got to get through, you got to go through the quarterback and you know, the linebacker to get there. Can and you so... introduce me to John Nintendo? Right. <laughs> <laughs> And so I got an email address for somebody in license, and they gave me a one-line response, which said, um, we don't license retro IPs, good luck. And that was really... <laughs> oh, wow. I was like, wow, there's two ways I can take that, and I'm going to take a way that means 
good luck, have fun, and not good luck, don't get sued. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and so, so that was kind of where I went with that. Um, but so over the years since then, um, you know, obviously, like working with Earthbound stuff remained a goal. And so initially, we're like, okay, well, we're clearly not getting licensed. So we're just going to have to try to make stuff that we're comfortable selling that we don't feel infringes on you know intellectual property or copyright or whatever um and by doing that and trying to respect itoi and hobonichi and nintendo's rights in the property that really kind of established the fan gamer ethic and the like fan gamer design approach to things which is where we just reference stuff and we try to evoke the feeling of uh of a certain game instead of just putting the game's logo on a shirt or whatever yeah and you know that that was that was really important for the foundation of the company. And obviously, you know, since then we've ended up doing a lot of bigger IPs where we where we have the uh, the right to do that. Like we can put the logo on a shirt, especially. And you know, sometimes we do that now. Like for Metal Gear, when we got the Metal Gear license, uh, I was talking to our designers like, we got to get that logo on a shirt. I want the logo <laughs> on a shirt. It's one of <laughs> one of few game logos that I think is objectively cool. And I would want to wear it. Girl, you know? I want my yeah. logo on my shirt. I want yes, it on my chest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But even in spite of all that, we've still kept that goal in mind of working with Nintendo and Etor. And so, you know, in our various interactions over Kobanichi and Nintendo, that's always come up. Uh, every opportunity we get, we bring it up, you know, sometimes very subtly, sometimes directly. Um, we're like, hey, you know, if you want to work on stuff, we should definitely work on stuff. Uh, and hold on just a moment. No worries. Okay, guys, mods are gone. Let's, let's get out those. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I was a Starman.net mod. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm calling the internet. Oh, not police. the internet. I have. <laughs> I have to say, it's so weird, all the David Hayter impressions, considering, like, I know his family personally. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we should get him on the show one day. <laughs> this is why I, I at least hope I was doing an okay yeah, job. You were. <laughs> I'll have to refer this to his, uh, his nephews. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so sorry no about that. Um... So anyway, yeah, the, the goal has always been to do something. And that's something that uh, we're still working on to this day. Uh, who knows if and when it will finally come to fruition, but it is um, it is always in the back of my mind. And in the, really, well, it's in the front of my mind. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, can't, can't say much more beyond that, but still working on it. No worries. And, well, you know, if you guys are still working on it, if you ever need help, our doors are open. You know, if you need... I was gonna say, I know, I know exactly yeah, where to go. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. We would be definitely willing to help you on any type of level with that. Anything to get, anything to get the mother series some love. Absolutely. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, interestingly, on the topic of uh, possible mother merchandise, recently Yasuhiro Nagata from the Hopanichi Company asked if any manga artists were interested in Mother. Do you think this question will lead to more content for the series? What are your thoughts on the Mother series' future? Boy, so I I remember back when Mother 3, well actually it was really, it was Mother 1 plus 2 was announced. And that was kind of a bolt of lightning and that was the point at which I realized, like, wait a second. There's this massive, like, IP, like, cash that these that Hobonichi has to work with. And they could potentially keep doing this forever. Like, they're releasing, <laughs> re-releasing this game on this new console. And that, that was the first time that it occurred to me. I was like, oh, wait, they, they could do this for, like, future consoles. Um... And ever since then, obviously, that's been the case. Like they've been, they've been very careful with it, and they're very picky about how and when um, they do that stuff. But they, you know, it's clearly something that they're willing and able to do. And so, for that reason, you know, like I, I definitely can see that, you know, Earthbound and the Mother series in general uh, definitely has a lot of life left in it, which was not something that I felt, you know, necessarily back in the early two thousands. Like there was a lot of doom and gloom in the community, like. Well, all right, Earthbound's dead. It's never coming back. We're never going to see it again in any capacity. 
we might as well give up. Um, and that, that conversation kept, you know, it recurred frequently in the community. Like, you know, all right, well, this place is going to be dead in a year, so let's get out of here. <laughs> you know? um, but I definitely uh, can see that, you know, uh, Itoi, partly because um, he's got a, you know, a financial interest, but especially because he's, I think he has a personal connection to the game that other companies don't necessarily have with their licenses. Like, you know, uh, uh, I, I can't think of a good example off the top of my head. A lot of companies have acquired an IP through some weird circuitous path, and it ends up landing, you know, at, the, at some big publisher's uh, portfolio. And it, you know, it'll probably, it, it might get, you know, cycled again when they finally release a, a batch of arcade classics or whatever. But for the most part, they don't know and don't care. And thankfully, that's not the case with Earthbound. Like, Itoi was, um, he thought ahead enough and he cared enough about his creation to maintain a stake in the creation. And so it doesn't strictly belong to Nintendo or, you know, some third-party publisher. And so for that reason, I'm very optimistic that, you know, Earthbound is always going to be available in some form. Um, you know, these games will be uh, accessible to future generations. You know, they don't have to be pre- you know, even though it's it's great to preserve whatever we can. Um, and as far as the stuff that they're doing now, um, I don't I don't know anything. Like our, our connections at Hobonichi, um, you know, we don't have as many connections as we used to. Like we used to have better, you know, more more regular uh, or a, an easier way of talking to Hobonichi and finding out what's yeah. up and what what they're doing, which we don't really anymore. Um, but I. Whether or not I, 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 I don't know of, and I don't expect there to be a big thing. For me. Like I certainly don't expect Mother Four. Like I, I think I take Etoy and said like, yeah, that's it. You know, like we're not, we're not doing another Mother game. We're not publishing another Mother game. Yeah. Um, but I, I think Etoy recognizes, especially after all the mm-hmm. encounters he's had with like us and other people from the Earthbound community. Um, like with interviews and all this and petitions and interest and books yeah. and all these things that have happened in the wake of his creation. Um, I think he recognizes the importance of kind of keeping that spirit alive by occasionally dipping back in and like pulling out, you know, some some neat little nugget from the game and kind of uh, magnifying it and doing something cool and different with it. Even if it's as simple as like, uh, like a, a Techo cover. You know, where it's just like a cute little Mr. Saturn pattern, or whatever. Um, or maybe as in depth as an actual like, like a comic series. Who knows? So yeah, what what the future holds, I have no idea. But I am optimistic in good hands. Which you know is not a foregone conclusion. There's a lot of games that do not end up in good hands. So you know, again, we're very lucky that uh, Etoy thought ahead and cared deeply enough to hold on to those rights, and uh, he's been a good steward of. Them. Yeah. For sure, he's he's definitely, yeah, definitely a very big advocate for this series, and you know it, it's it's good to see a creator have that connection with something that they've made, and you don't see that very often. Um, I see that with you know some content creators like Stephen George and you know Chuck Conroy. I watch their content very often. I see that passion day through and through. But when it comes to marketing and game development and all just business-related junk, uh, you, you, you tend to see that less. So for somebody who has been making, uh, you know, a, a trilogy for 30 years, you know, it, 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 it's something to not only appreciate from afar, but also really respect, you know? So... I don't know. I don't know how else to describe that, but than than you have, uh, Reed. I th- I think that's just something that he really has grown to be become a part of. It's it's not only just part of us, but it's a part of him too. Yeah, and I, I think that springs entirely from his investment, like his emotional and um, personal investment in the games. Like without without caring as deeply as he did when he was making, um, I think we'd be on a different timeline, you know. And like the 
the the thought and care that he put into these games way back then has really echoed <laughs> and that's and that you know continues to affect and um I don't know. It, it, it's just it's it's made for a very good timeline. I'm very happy with the timeline that we ended up in <laughs> with the Mother series. You know, it's it's just uh, it's it's just a wonderful game, and it's a it's a wonderful uh, uh, thing to look back on and realize, like, wow, that you know the the investment and the the care that went into this has just paid dividends over and over and over, and not and not not financially. I mean, financially as well, but you know, just the the, the way that it has fed and nurtured uh, so many people and creators and communities that came in its wake. Definitely. Yeah, uh, I think we really got a, a good sense of that over this time talking with you too. And uh, we'd like to thank you very much for that time. We've been talking for a while now. <laughs> um, but thank you so much, Reed, for your time. Uh, where can people find you and Fangamer on social media if they'd like to follow your projects in the future? And is there anything you'd like the Mother community to know as a closing statement for the end of this interview? Well, you can follow... I mean, Fangamer is easy enough to find. Um, and Twitter is really the, you know, the, the social media thing that we focus most on. Um, so any, anytime there's new knowing about Fangamer, it usually ends up on Twitter. Um, and I am on Twitter as well, uh, at Reedman. Uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't have a whole lot to say and I, uh, I don't always, uh, keep a very tight focus on earthbound stuff. So, to, you know, be prepared to just get whatever weird <laughs> junk is floating around in my brain. Sure. <laughs> Apologies for that. Um, and parting words, I guess I just want to convey, uh, my gratefulness, like how happy I am that, this is still going like like i said before there was this constant like idea in the community that like the community itself was doomed and that you know it had this very limited time span and that there was no way that people were going to still be talking about earthbound after a couple of years um and it kind of became a joke at some point where it's like okay you know you know <laughs> back in 2000 everybody look at us now mm -hmm. you know and then you know we kept that kept just uh, the ante kept getting up um and you know obviously that's the the form in which that has happened has changed like we went from you know doing petitions and getting noticed by big gaming we started doing the fan translation we did a book and then we did a convention you know and now there's other communities branching up starting to do their own product and i really just want to encourage um People to give their hearts to this uh, to this game in the community because it's really worth. You know, like there's I, I can't say that about a lot of games that you know they are worth uh, giving a lot of your time and energy to. But the Earthbound community is definitely uh, something I can heartily endorse, and uh, I appreciate all the stuff that you guys have done and keeping that spirit alive. It's, uh, very beautiful to me. Thank you. I, it means a lot to hear from from you uh, in particular about that, but we thank you for all the things that you have done for sure. Um, Absolutely, so it it means a lot coming from you, um, and we hope that we can do what we can for the community and and keep that spirit, like you said, alive, but also um, trying to do what's best and what we can make better moving forward and you know our content and try to get creative get insp inspired you know um whatever whatever comes to mind just just try try it you know and definitely don't be afraid to dream big mm -hmm. like that like i said one of my favorite things come up with a really impressive good idea that I thought was exciting or funny or whatever and to try to make it happen um, and I think that's really the heart of a lot of the most fun uh, experiences that the community had together was like hey let's try to do this really unlikely kind of dumb thing that somebody came up with like could we do that <laughs> you know? and there, there's a lot of uh, fun branching paths off 
conversations like that. So yeah, get out there, make some friends, and uh, think of something stupid to do because that's cool. For sure, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Well, that will be it. Uh, thank you for this interview, Reed. Um, that was great. This was wonderful.